Your female entrepreneur playbook is on the way. Better yet, it's an audio edition. So just lace up your shoes and get busy while you listen to this episode. My guest is going to help you become credible, have authority, and boost your brand. And how, you might ask? (laughs) Listen, I can tell you the power of a book is great. It puts your words, your message, and your story in front of so many over and over again. And though I don't like to refer to books as calling cards, I do think they make it easy to those marketing or self-promotion adverse. It's easier to promote a book and to get yourself out there when maybe otherwise you can't. And whether you have a traditional publisher or you self-publish or you do something in between, and you can do that too, it's called a hybrid. The value of a book also includes the fact that it will force you to express your message clearly and concisely, and it will boost your confidence and give you sound bites that you will use forever. You'll use them in social media. You will use them when you're interviewed about your book, for instance, here. And when you have this podcast, you have been interviewed by somebody, you have something to share that says, hey, look at this, this third party thinks I'm a big deal, (laughs) essentially. This episode is a don't miss. I have to admit, I didn't know my guest prior to this episode. I am so glad for the good fortune that we had the opportunity to do this podcast, and it's not the last time she'll be on. So I'm Deborah Atkinson. You're listening to what has been Fitness Marketing Mastery and is now She Means Fitness Business Podcast, where I address marketing and sales strategies that are anything but sleazy, salesy, and pushy. In fact, they're easy, enjoyable, and fun so that you can build both a business you enjoy and feel good about and a life that you love. So you have the freedom to enjoy the prosperity that you have earned. I also, you know, share hormone balancing programming tips that we use at Flipping 50 to help gain more midlife women. So if you are looking for more midlife clients, number one, listen up, then go to the show notes and you'll get all of the links to my guests, but you'll also get a link to five days to more midlife clients. And it'll be right there waiting for you when you're ready. Let's dive in. This is a good one. My guest, Patricia Wooster is a former corporate software executive turned traditionally published author of 13 books and the self-published author of three business books. She is the founder of Wooster Media that transforms leaders, entrepreneurs, athletes, influencers, and thought leaders into published authors who amplify their message through high-impact books. Patricia has worked on over 350 traditional publisher projects and helped countless others self-publish their books. She coaches people through the process of creating a transformational experience for their readers by mastering their message, engaging with their readers, and adhering to the high standards set by the traditional publishing industry. Her clients have landed agents, publishing contracts, speaking opportunities, and bestseller status. So buckle your seatbelts. We're going to explain how you two can do this. Patricia, thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Deborah. Okay. So for, we have to call out the elephant in the room for somebody who is thinking, what? I could never write a book. What do you say to that? Well, and I get that a lot, by the way, (laughs) because I'm not, you know, I'm not working with writers, right. Or creative writing majors or any of those kind of things. And so the first thing I always say is that, um, 
in all the years that I've worked with people, and this is myself included, there is only one person that I can think of that I've ever worked with that I said, wow, this person is just a natural, super talented writer, you know, who needs to be out there in, in everybody's hands. You know, the thing about a book, and you learn this when you work with traditional publishers and now with self-publishing and all the services available, is it's a collaborative project. You know, the first draft is a draft, but then there's editors and formatters and cover designers and all kinds of people that step in to help. And really, you know, one of the things that I do, because everyone that I work with, um, there's not anyone I ever work with usually that is, say, writing the book as a hobby or, um, you know, occasionally I work with somebody that's retired, but everyone's really busy. I mean, they're entrepreneurs, they're, they're hustling their job, they've got families. And so what I've done is create a framework to really help people um, be able to write a book. So they're really focused more on their expertise and dropping that into the book than staring at a blank page because that's a really miserable experience. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Yes. So, so good. Okay. And you've had experience on both sides. So I kind of want to come back to that, but not not tackle it right away because you've got that experience of have gone through traditional publishing and you know, know very well the self-publishing. And I think we should kind of come back full circle. We'll end with some of those questions like the differences and um, time to publication and holding that book between the two of them as well. But right now, I mean, we have we have trainers here who everybody would love to have a bigger reach, a bigger influence. How can our listeners build their brand and build it online? Yeah. So I think everybody needs that foundational piece, right? Because even if we're really good at like Instagram reels or TikTok or whatever your platform of choice is, there's so much noise, right? So people are scrolling through and and it's a very quick experience. And so you really need a foundational piece to build that like, know, and trust, particularly when you're in front of a brand new audience or trying to bring more people into your your kind of your world. And so what I like about a book is it almost kind of goes to that Gary V um, repurposing strategy where he says, like, start with the video and then, you know, have it transcribed as a blog post and then have it cut up into all the social media stuff. A book is almost the same thing is if you really take the time and, you know, and, and just for the purpose of this conversation, just to simplify things is. I'm always talking about traditional publishing standards. I don't really care if you self-publish, but we want a book that looks amazing. Like we want a book that looks like it belongs on the shelf at a bookstore. So if you really take the time and are intentional about the way that you, you set up your book, you will never have to create content again. One, you'll build like, know, and trust with your readers. You're going to attract the right people to your business and you'll repel those that aren't a good fit. So if your market is people that are 60 and over for health and wellness, then you want to repel the 20 year olds um, because that's not your market. And so that's what your book will help you do. But what I love about it is, is you then use it to repurpose for all your social media content. Um, you'll always know, you'll never run out of ideas for YouTube videos or any of those kind of things. But then also, what I'm doing with most of my clients now, because they've have had to move online is we take that book then, and then the book is kind of the what and the why of what you do. And then the, like a digital program, whether it's a membership program or a digital course or group coaching, that becomes the how you do it. And so we're taking that book and we're turning it into other digital assets that are more high ticket so we have a way to ascend the reader within our environment and, you know, and keep them close. So at the end of the book, you want people to say, what can I do next with this person? And so that's why I love books so much for, you know, so many different occupations, because it is that entry point um, and it's got a global reach as well. 
Yeah, so awesome. And I love what you've hinted at here. So that you talk about the value ladder. So let's really define that for a listener who this maybe feels like this is a new thing. I don't quite understand what that is and how somebody can create that for themselves. Yeah, absolutely. So I come from corporate. So when I left corporate and people, all these entrepreneurs are like, value ladder. I was like, what is that? (laughs) And so it's very easy as business people to have sort of distributed offers. They're just kind of all over the place. So, you know, maybe you do one-on-one training and then, you know, you've got three friends that approach you and say, hey, can you do something with a group of us? And then maybe you create some menus for people and you're selling those and you've got them on this other website. And so you have all these like disconnected products and services and it's confusing to the person, you know, to a client because like I said, they're not 100% aware of everything that we're doing or paying attention. It's also people don't even know what you have. And so a value ladder is you have to think of it as a very organized structure to take somebody. So the entry point would be, maybe a lead magnet, something for free, or maybe you've got a, on your website, somebody in exchange for their email address, you're going to give them a a workout video, uh, something that they could do or a, a week's menu plan or something. So they get that for free. So now they're on your email list and you can start building a relationship with them through email marketing. So the next step may be like a, um, a 30 day weight loss challenge or a 30 day, um, you know, 75 hard. If people were paying for that would be a perfect example, but a workshop, um, anything like that, but it should be low ticket. Like it should be readily available where most people could get into it. So we're talking like between 27 and $97. Then that next thing could be like, Maybe you've got an online course or group coaching program or something, and that can be several thousand dollars. I mean, it can it can be sky's the limit, but the highest ticket thing, the very top of the ladder, the very hardest thing for somebody to get to should be one-on-one with you because you are not scalable. So if you're a trainer, you, you only have so many hours in the day. So you want that to be your highest ticket offer. The one thing I tell people when they say, well, I don't even know where to start with creating all these things is the easiest thing to do is start at the very bottom, which is some way to get people's email address. So it could be like when we write books, we also give within that book, they get a free downloadable that helps implement something in the book. So it's an exchange for an email address. But you could, if you don't have a book, you start with a lead magnet of some sort. So you start at the bottom of the value ladder and you stop at, start at the very top of the value ladder, which is one-on-one, because those are the two easiest thing. You can become a coach or a trainer if you're already doing that. You don't need like computer systems and tech and you don't have to know software and all those kind of things. And then you can just start filling some pieces in in between with the goal being of really thinking about if somebody new finds me online, what makes the most sense? They're probably not going to find you and say, oh, I think I'll pay $5,000 to work with that person. You're going to have to like slowly cultivate that relationship. And that's, that's kind of the point behind the value ladder. And you can have more than one value ladder. That's the thing. But you should have a group of products that really go together where it makes sense. Love it. I absolutely love it. So let's, let me summarize again. So I heard two things and I want to clarify. So the book actually is not free or is it? No. So, I mean, there are people that do like a book funnel. So you'll, it's not, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's free plus shipping. So I mean, you are kind of paying something. Um, But for that to work, that's not great for somebody in startup mode because you have to figure out a way to get traffic there, which means that now you're running Facebook ads and you've got to be, they're they're expensive and you got to be really good at Facebook ads. So no, it's not, it's a low ticket. So you could even have something like I have a lead magnet on my website that's free, 
And then, um, but I also have a book all within the same value ladder, but that's because I created the lead magnet while I was writing my book. So, um, you can kind of play around with it, but the book is really the way to start getting people introduced to your, your higher ticket programs. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Great clarification. All right. Let's kind of come back to the building of the brand online. And I want to ask what goes into that book. So I've got, you know, let's say we've got a hundred personal trainers listening who work with a lot of my listeners work with women in midlife because we're also helping them market and sell to them, but also helping them program for hormone balancing. What will set each of them apart? Because we do believe there's an abundance of people who need our help. So they should all be able to thrive. How does somebody create their brand within that book? Yeah. So this is an interesting industry, right? Because I think there's more books in the health and wellness space than there is in any other category besides fiction or children's. Um, And that's because people are interested in health and wellness. Mm. You know, if people weren't interested, there wouldn't be that many books. Um, And so what we do is, you know, to, in the simplest terms is if you could, and I didn't make this framework up, I just use it for books, but I think it was developed for products or something, but it's this concept of pain to pleasure Island. So the start of your book really, you know, we're, and I'm, I'm talking about your book's journey. Okay. And so Pain Island is where your ideal client or reader is. It's like maybe, um, you know, they can't sleep at night. And they're starting to, weight is starting to appear in places that it never, never appeared before. They have a hard time spot treating it. You know, whatever that Pain Island looks like, that's who your reader is. That's where they are. So you have to acknowledge that. Um, And that's kind of where that book starts. And that is, you know, that is in the marketing kind of in the book description and stuff is what your problem you're addressing. Then you have pleasure Island on the other side. That is where they want to be. That's what they're, that's the final destination. And so the, the trick with your book is you are, it's like you're putting them in a boat on pain Island and you're taking them over to pleasure Island And you need to address all of the challenges that they're going to have along the way, the things they need to know to get over to Pleasure Island, maybe the epiphanies or things that they're going to have. And the way we really differentiate is in two ways. One is who our audience is. So our audience is more than just, say, um, a 55 to 65-year-old woman we need to not only understand their demographics, but we need to understand where do they want to be next in their lives? Because when we understand where our clients are trying to go, then that tells us what kind of stories and examples we should use in our book to empower and inspire that audience. So they feel like they can really do it. The other way we differentiate ourselves is our stories. Nobody else has our own journey, our own stories. And so that's the other piece of that. But the other one too is um, where you end your client, what that pleasure island looks like is with your book, you know, you can't write an encyclopedia or nobody would read it, Mm -hmm. is the key is identifying what is the number one result that I want to deliver by the end of the book. It Mm -hmm. could be a message. It could be a quick win. um, It could be a new way of thinking, but whatever that thing is, I guarantee that not every every single person in the room is going to come up with exactly what that result looks like and nobody's going to have the same stories. So that's how we really like differentiate her because that that number one results really the hook, you know, of, of the book <laughs> that rhymes. Um but anyway, um so those are the ways that you can you can do that, but I think all really infusing your stories and client success stories too is a great thing to include. Yeah. Oh, I love that. That is golden, really golden. Okay. So, and that's where we're talking a signature story, but I want to come back to, as we were talking value ladders, 
You might have multiple value ladders you mentioned earlier, where maybe it's a segment that you work with, then you have a value ladder for them and you work with a different segment and you have a value ladder for them. And the way I would think of it for all of you who are working with midlife women, especially though, who may not want to back themselves into a corner, it it is important for you to have a niche, but you can still work with other people. This is how you might build and establish different things, but even targeting your midlife women, some of them are going to come to you because they want to get off of medications or avoid taking medications. And others are going to come to you because they want specifically weight loss or more muscle definition. I mean, those are kind of two different levels and kinds of pain points. You could have different different value ladders. Patricia, nod, am I on the right track? No, that's perfect. And I was just okay. thinking of a friend of mine and she she does a lot with gut health. And so mm-hmm. she has a whole value ladder around gut health and um, wellness and women that don't want to be on medications for it and special diets and menus and all those kind of things. And that's one value ladder. But she also owns a Pilates studio which um, was not open <laughs> during COVID. Mm, yes. And so she created a Pilates membership site online and recorded all kinds of videos um, in a studio at home and had, and those are, that's a much younger group of women. And it's a totally different, it's women that a lot of them want, they have young children, they want organic food in their home and those kind of things. But it was two very different value ladders that she created. And so, you know, one person may not be aware of the other value ladder because it really doesn't have anything to do with them. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Great. So that said, listener, don't be overwhelmed. You're not going to have to do both of them at once. You just need to start with a part of one. Okay. Every listener out there may be thinking and saying or feeling at this point, what can I do to generate revenue fast? Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, I did this, it was during COVID. I had a co-author book, a mastermind leader had approached me and said, I've got all these mastermind participants who are kind of a lot of them had physical businesses and those kind of things. And you know, I want to put together a project for him. And so we did like a co-author book and it was a kind of a mastermind in a book. And so one question that everybody had to answer is if you lost everything, what would you do in the next 30 days to generate income? And we got all kinds of amazing answers from people. But I would say that, you know, very consistently, we heard some version of doing a workshop is a great way um, to do something because you don't, like I said, you, you need a zoom account, you know, or something you can even do it in a Facebook, um, group, private group, but, um, doing some kind of workshop is great because it's also great to test an idea to see if there's even an interest before you build like a value ladder. So a couple of years ago, I actually hosted a workshop for women on helping them create their signature story because, I didn't know if anyone would be interested enough in a full blown course. And so I just tested it out. And within two weeks, you know, I decided two weeks later, I threw it and I just, it was all organic traffic. I went on LinkedIn, I went on Facebook, I went on Instagram stories and chatted it up um, and got a lot of people into that workshop. And then from the workshop, you can sell them what they want next, which is usually some kind of like private or group coaching. And so once again, you don't need any tools for that. And really, you know, the great thing about coaching and even a digital course is you can create as you go, as long as you kind of have an outline. So people know what the result is, you can record as you're doing the training. And so I'm a big fan of organic traffic because I think the ads thing is a, there's a big learning curve and it can get very expensive. And the other thing I would tell your listeners is there's an app, a social media app called Clubhouse. It's a social audio app. 
Yep. And I, you know, I, I kind of compare it to, it's, it's like being on an interactive podcast (laughs) and I got on it in January of the following year. So during COVID, I've been on it a little over a year and I have generated so much revenue from my business from just being in there. And so that's a great place to, you know, to, to go in there with a few friends and host a conversation around a health and wellness topic like this community of women and get people to sign up to come in for, you know, some kind of low ticket workshop or something. But that's what I would do. Great mention. So I haven't heard a lot of people talk about Clubhouse anymore. In fact, a lot of my friends who were quick to jump on have kind of left, but I think still, or maybe even because of that, (laughs) that makes it even better for you if you're newer to it. It's not too late. So, you know, check that out. And the one advantage of it is it is audio only. If you didn't hear that, you don't have to be camera ready. (laughs) Yeah. And so I don't know about you, but you have to hunt and peck to get the days when I shower, right? So it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, really? I got to do the whole thing, the whole thing? That's take takes too much time. All right. I love that. Um, I, I really want, because you've got, you've been on both sides of the desk or the office maybe, <laughs> for you to paint this picture and say, you know, if you could look at some of the biggest mistakes that entrepreneurs make, what would be on that list? You know, I think the the biggest mistake is that, and this isn't, I mean, obviously it's not everyone, but it seems that a lot of people who are super passionate about what they do, um, they're, they're very, they're very adverse to promoting themselves. <laughs> They'd rather do their thing And Mm -hmm. trust me, I'd rather write books than, you know, be on Instagram lives and all those kind of things and putting my face out there, but then I wouldn't be able to write books. And so I think a lot of the entrepreneurs are really make mistakes in not while they're building, whatever they're building, not preparing for that rainy day by starting to cultivate some sort of audience online somewhere. And it doesn't really matter where it's at is they wait till they have the widget to sell and then they scurry to figure out who's going to buy it. And so I really think not getting out there. I think the other thing too is going back to that, not having the value ladder, but having a lot of kind of confusion around what they sell, what they do, um, not having some sort of plan around what they're going to be promoting And, um, the one thing I've learned from a lot of different mentors and masterminds is that you really need to take your calendar and you need to choose what you're going to be promoting every single month of the year Mm -hmm. and not promote a lot of different things. It doesn't mean you don't sell a lot of different things. It just means that what are you going to be talking about all over the place and really make sure you have some kind of plan around that. And I did it all wrong for a long time where I'd be like, one day I'm talking about this thing and the next thing that thing. And like I said, it's very, very, very confusing. And you really need to be asking for the sale. I mean, people will procrastinate until <laughs> the very last minute. So you have to let people know that you're open for business. And I think it's hard for a lot of the people who are very passionate about what they do because they just want to do the thing. Yeah. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head. I think very many, you know, health and fitness coaches will tell me, you know, and I've heard this for 25, 30 years since I've been hiring, training and firing um, fitness and health coaches that I am so passionate, right, about what I'm doing, but find it very, very hard to sell. And I can vouch for this that even even while uh, you know I kind of worked for myself and then I hopped into a position uh, as a manager for a personal training department where you know I wasn't marketing myself as a trainer I was marketing you know twenty or twenty four that we'd grown to and then I left and I you know started my business to help 
fitness and health pros, but realized I've got to be doing it. And I realized then I am marketing myself. And I was like, I had to step back. I was like, oh my gosh, it was so easier to promote the business and the other trainers in our program. But now like I'm naked, you know, I'm Mm -hmm. like, it's just me. And so there is a bit of, you know, not wanting to, and I totally understand nobody wants to feel sleazy, salesy, or pushy. And we've all probably got things we need to deal with in our own history that are not even truths. We just have these limited beliefs about talking and how to promote and sell in a more authentic way. But that's why coming back to the book, telling your signature story when you get down to, this is why I'm doing this instead of teaching or being a plumber or a lawyer or a doctor this is why this, that I think helps you be a person, not just a trainer. And that's, that's the golden that I love. Those were so, so great. Those, those mistakes, because I think they really shed some light. If you don't mind, could we go back and talk just a little bit about, talk about self-publishing and, and how it works if somebody wanted to work with you? Yeah. So, you know, self-publishing is great now. Um, it, you know, when, I, when I started traditionally publishing, it was, it was very confusing if somebody wanted to self-publish and then we went through a, and so that would have been like, I don't know, 15 years ago. And then we, then we went through this predatory period and they're still out there by the way, <laughs> of people who said, Ooh, writing books or, you know, offering book services is, you know, that's a lucrative business. So non-publishing people, people with that experience, but business people started creating companies and it got very predatory where they would try to get you coming and going, which I always say they, nobody can take you coming and going. So they either need to pay you on the front end, like a traditional publisher and offer you an advance, and then they get a percent on the back end but they can't be charging you on the front end and then taking a cut on the back. And so that's just something I always make sure to mention because it drives me nuts. It's actually one of the reasons I got into this business was because of every person I knew was getting approached by a predatory company. And so self-publishing now is great. And, you know, I've, my last three books, I chose to self-publish. Now I have an agent and I'm in the system. So it would be easier for me to get a traditional publishing deal than somebody who was just starting out. But the reason I've chosen it is for a couple reasons. And this is very important for people to understand if they're interested is that it allows you to control the pricing and the marketing of your book, which is a big deal because there's a lot of great things that you can do to promote your book. But if it's traditionally published, you have no control over the distribution, the marketing, the pricing, any of that. The other thing is, and this is the big one for entrepreneurs, is you control 100% of the real estate in the book, which means that you can have a call to action. And um, that means that say you write a book on um, you know, menopause, for example, and holistic ways to, to deal with menopause is not only can your book give information and share stories and all those kind of things, but you can offer something for free, say a journal for them to journal how they feel when they're trying certain things or, or whatever, something that goes with the book in exchange for their email address. And the most valuable thing that a person can own is somebody's email address for their business. It's not a follower on Instagram. It's their no. email address. Yeah. That is where the money is. And so that is not something a traditional publisher will allow you to do because they don't like putting links in books because if you change your link, then they could, you know, (laughs) be in trouble. But, or you can QR code it, but that's a whole other story. So there's so many amazing self-publishing services. Also, you can go to market as soon as your book's done versus a traditional publisher, it could be two, three years if you get a deal to get your book out there. And so, um, you know, working with people who 
are going to just charge you for these services is the way to go in self-publishing. So if you need a coach, you pay a coach. If you need a book cover design, you pay a book cover design, but not giving away any of the rights or the percentage to the book sales is really, you know, something you want to keep in mind and trying to be part of some kind of community of other people that are doing the same things that you're doing as well is really important. So those are kind of the self-publishing things. I run writers groups. Um, I do one-on-one coaching, not, not quite as much anymore. I've got digital programs. Um, and then I do a lot of like free Q and A's and things like that on clubhouse and Instagram. Um, even though, I mean, I'm not, I'm very, um, I just talked about having keep, keep, keeping your brand present. I'm not always consistent, but I am very consistent with Clubhouse. <laughs> Great. Okay. So to somebody who's wondering this, and I may actually be asking a question that you listener don't know to ask, but I think this is a good one. So sometimes there's a question, if you're self-publishing, does that mean still that I could be in all of the like Barnes and Noble and the big bookstores, not just on Amazon or, or um, 2,000 copies in my garage. Yes. So first of all, you never want 2,000 copies in your garage. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I live in Florida. We don't have basements. So garage space is a premium. So there's no books in our garage, but um First of all, just as a side note, so Amazon, um, when you upload your book to Amazon, for example, Mm -hmm. you can buy author copies at a special deal. So for like three bucks a piece, and you will never find the, um, because this is something that people think, you'll never be able to order 2000 books to put in your garage for probably less than $3 a piece. And and with Amazon, it's print on demand. So I know a lot of people who don't even care if anyone buys their book on Amazon. They just basically use it as their book printer. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the thing with the um, with distribution, and it's very confusing because everyone that writes a blog post has any kind of self-publishing company or anything says that they offer distribution. The only thing you need to have distribution is what's called an ISBN number. So if you look on the back of any book, there's a barcode Mm -hmm. with a really long number. Mm -hmm. So Amazon will give you one for free. Well, that's not because they're overly generous. It's actually because (laughs) their barcode only works at Amazon. And so Barnes and Noble won't take your book. So your local bookstore won't because they don't have any way to scan it for their system or libraries. And so you'll see these companies that will say, we'll get you distribution. And all they're doing is going to a website that's called myidentifiers.com. And it's owned by a company called Bowker. It's the only place in the US that you can get um, a real number. And you buy the number for, depending on if you're buying in bulk or whatever, but the most they would be is $100. And then that number belongs to you. And now you have distribution. So it automatically lists your book in the Library of Congress. And now, so the thing that people understand is Barnes and Noble loves local authors. Like they are so good to local authors. So you can walk into a Barnes and Noble with your self published book. And this is just, you know, back to, you know, you've published it with traditional publishing standards. You've got a nice cover design, those kind of things. And you can ask for the manager and you can say, I am a local author. You know, can you, will you carry some of my books? And you'll get one of two answers, either absolutely. And they'll just go order and stock them in their store. Or they'll off just say, well, we can't stock them in the store, but we, what we can offer you is a signing and you can bring your books in here and sell them and do a reading or whatever, an event or something. And they, they take maybe a small cut of the deal. And so, um, yeah, you can absolutely, now online, you can upload your book to Barnes and Noble without walking into a store and anyone can go to the Barnes and Noble website and buy your book. And you can do that for free. You can do that without leaving your house. So yeah. And there's, I mean, there's 
gosh, I don't even know how many, maybe 40 or 50 different places online that you can sell your book, you know, like iBooks and things. But Amazon's always going to be your biggest distributor. But I would absolutely hit your local. The other place that's really, really good, and nobody does this. I was shocked that nobody does this, but nobody talks about book sales. And um, and it doesn't matter if your book's self-published, traditionally published, or whatever. But you can contact associations, yoga studios, um, health and wellness centers, um, people that host big events, um, all kinds of different places, because the people that organize those things need swag. And you are making their job easier. You are literally helping them check something off their list when you email them and tell them that you've got a book um, that would fit great with their audience. And it literally is an email. I sold 2000 copies of one of my books through an email to an event. And that's just because I had a good title. So, um, you know, it's really important to look at those book sales opportunities because not only is it good for your wallet, but it's great then because you have a community of people who know each other a lot of times who are reading your book at the exact same time. So people are talking about it and those kind of things. And you can bundle it by doing some kind of like book group or a workshop or I could go on and on. <laughs> oh my gosh. No, you are golden girl. And I think, I think that you could, but I think you have earned this question and, and you're going to have a lot of new best friends. Where can listeners get more Patricia? Cause I know we all want it so, after me y'all so get in line. All right. So the easiest for you is you can go to Patricia Wooster, which is W O O S T E R.com. And there's, you know, there's a button where you can schedule a call with me or find all my social media accounts and those kind of things. Um, you can also, you know, just look up my name on Instagram. I'm on there and I'm very, um, responsive to DMS or any of those kind of things too. But I also, I host a lot of challenges. So somebody gets on my email list, which you can get on through the website or something. We do a ton of five day free challenges as well in Facebook, um, to help people get started on writing their books. Beautiful. Which is just what you need, listener. If until you tuned in, you didn't realize that you want to write a book, we'll use want, not need. But (laughs) it it is a fantastic way to both build your credibility and authority. But I would also say, circling back to the intro, to build your own confidence. And when you're writing a book, I think there is no way that you can help but build your confidence because you are really nailing your message down more concisely, precisely. And in a lot of ways, you're saying it over and over again throughout the book, but maybe in different ways. So Patricia, this has been golden. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. Okay, everybody, now it's your turn. I'm sure there was a question and you wish I would have continued with her and monopolized her entire day. But if you do have a question, I'd love if you'd put it below the show notes and that'll be at fitnessmarketingmastery.com forward slash female entrepreneur playbook. And what are you waiting for? The world does need us all more than ever. 